a pleasure to have all of you here. This is an incredible, incredible night we have ahead of you. And I just want to say how honored Lincoln Center is to be partnered with the Roundabout Youth Ensemble and Enough and all of the incredible stories, artists that have come together to make this night possible, not just here, but across the country. And this is just a movement that is, that is moving. And you're a part of it. You're a part of it by being here tonight. And we're so grateful. We believe here at Lincoln Center, and I hope that you see this in the work that we're putting out, that art actually has the capability of not just making sense of the senseless, but also putting ourselves into a place of healing and hope and action. And so that's why we're all here tonight. We hope you leave with all of those things and we hope you leave feeling more connected to the stories of our time and to this place. We just announced our summer season today. I hope you check it out. I hope you come back here to the atrium where we have free programming four or five nights a week. And I look forward to seeing you there. Please enjoy the show. justice because at the core of every activist movement, of every rallying cry, of every uh, legislation that gets passed, at the core of that are the people who are going to be impacted by that legislation. And our job as artists is to remind all of these legislators, to remind the um, organizations and the institutions out there that there are people behind every decision that you make. And so storytellers unite. Remind us of our humanity, tell your stories, and hashtag enough. Hi, it's Brian Cranston. I'm in a theater, as you can see. And it's uh, very exciting for me. I'm doing a play in Los Angeles at the Geffen Theater. Kind of like the theater that you will be presenting your work to. And I just wanted to just deliver a little message to you to welcome you to the second annual nationwide reading for hashtag enough plays to end gun violence. You are one of more than 50 communities from New York to Portland, Chicago to Orlando, Atlanta to Milwaukee, who are listening to the voices of our young people as they say, enough is enough. So thank you for joining this cross-country effort. When the NRA succeeded in blocking President Lyndon Johnson's legislation on gun control, which would have included national registration for all guns, he said, quote, the voices that blocked these safeguards were not the voices of an aroused nation. They were the voices of a powerful lobby, a gun lobby, that has prevailed for the moment in an election year. And those of us who are really concerned about crime must somehow, someday, make our voices felt. These plays and these readings are meant to arouse a nation 
And it's up to all of us to hear them and to make these voices felt, not just in Washington, but here in our own communities, in our own schools, in our own homes. These are voices demanding our attention on the behalf of too many voices that have been silenced by guns. These are voices that can change us if we commit to listening and to acting and to refusing to be silent. To the eight remarkable hashtag enough playwrights whose words we are hearing and honoring at this reading, Mackenzie, Ariana, Willa, Anya, Taylor, Tane, Cameron, and Wynn, thank you for your voices, your insight, your courage, and your passion. Through your plays, you are not only showing what can happen when art and activism collide, you are also fulfilling the virtual central role that young people play in the story of our nation. You are the generation of empathy, equity, and justice. You are what comes next, and we are fortunate to follow your lead as we envision a better future together. Together, we hear you. Together, we say enough. Congratulations to all of you. Hashtag Enough is a story with three acts. Act one is writing the plays. Act two is presenting the plays. And act three is what comes after the plays. It's about action. It's about what you do next. You see, theater has always been the place where we can change the world one room at a time, where we rehearse the future that we want to create. And our young people, they're ready to show us the way. So thank you. Thank you for not only being here and for listening, but thank you for all the work to come. And here's just a little glimpse of the larger movement that you're a part of. Angry, informed, inspired, reflective, outraged, moved, hopeful, uncomfortable, activated. I grew up in a community where gun violence is the norm. It's been shooters as long as I can remember. My oldest going into school, I want this to be something that I don't have to worry about. I believe in the power of theater to transform communities. It's a chance to put art and activism together. Because it's time for something to change. Enough! Enough. Hello everyone, welcome. We're so excited to have you here tonight. My name is Leah Spawn. I'm a part of Roundabout Theatre Company's Youth Ensemble. Tonight you'll be seeing eight new plays by young writers who say enough is enough and call for an end to gun violence. This is a nationwide reading, so we are one of many organizations performing these works tonight, all with the goal of sparking necessary conversations about gun violence. Theater is a very strong tool for causing change in our world, and we are thrilled to have these impactful pieces to share with you. During this rehearsal process, our voices were valued and amplified when so often young voices are disregarded by those who are afraid of change. Many people have become desensitized to gun violence due, the, due to the frequency of these tragedies affecting young lives and disproportionately affecting marginalized communities. It is crucial that we educate and have these conversations no matter how uncomfortable or vulnerable they may be. Tonight and every day, we honor the lives lost to gun violence and we thank you for coming to see Meaningful Art. We are thrilled to be a part of this movement and share this performance with you. This is Roundabout Youth Ensemble, and we say enough. Welcome, Welcome to America, the land of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I've always wanted to watch the sunrise on a beach. I'm going to work in my community and make it better. I want to take up a new hobby. 
Do something artistic in my spare time. I want to see my nephew turn the tassel on his graduation cap. I dream to see my daughter grow up, but not too quickly. I want to be a poet and make my mama proud. I've got a crush on a senior who plays basketball. I hope he asks me to prom. I want to start a family, have all sorts of traditions, like huge Christmas dinners with the whole extended family. Look at this. Hopes, dreams, what could be possibly more American than dreaming? Welcome, Welcome to, to America, America, where every 15 minutes, a person is killed with a gun. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but as, at, as time, that is so often my job. In 15 minutes, someone, someone's dreams will never come true. It could be one of them. It could be you. Don't shoot the messenger. You've heard the statistics, but you've been talking statistics for years. And where's that gone to things? Stop talking statistics and start talking stories. After all, the clock is ticking. <laughs> Rehearsal by Willa Culinary. Culinary. <laughs> Sorry. Setting. The play is set in a spare, unpacific place with an emphasis on order. OK, let's begin. Can you tell me your name? Lourdes. And where do you go to school, Lourdes? I go to La Donna Preparatory. Would you tell me a little bit about your school, please? OK. It's in Malibu, a little private school, very exclusive. The campus is beautiful, old Spanish bungalows and eucalyptus trees. And it's expensive? Yes, it's very costly. Is it a good school, in your opinion? I would say it is. Everyone is really nice most of the time, so. Prince. OK, Prince. And would you like to describe La Donna? Well, let me see. There's only like 300 people at the whole school, so that's around 80 in our grade, right? Do you like having that many few people around? Yeah, I like it. It's what I'm used to. And what do you think of Miss Murphy? Miss Murphy? Murphy? Yes. Oh. What? Nothing. It's just, OK, I didn't know that what today was about. Do you have anything to say about her? Anything that comes to mind? Willem Davies. You're Willem Davis. Uh, yes. Is that a bad thing? No, no. My name is Gabriel. I'm 18 years old. It says here that you refer to the events of summer as rehearsal. Yeah. Rehearsal. rehearsal. How did that title come about? Um, I think Ms. Murphy started saying it like, OK, folks, we can save your rehearsal. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's how it came about. And what do you think about it when she started calling it that? I didn't really think about it at all. When did it start? It was summer session, so the school was at half capacity, or even less. Our grade wasn't big to begin with, so during summer session, we were, there were around um, about 30 people, five or so to a class. Do you have any recollection about who had the I, idea? Sorry, I don't really remember. And what about Willem? What about him? When he was selected. Probably the second week. There were lots of incidents in the area at the time. I think people don't actually know the toll it takes on kids their age. It takes quite a toll. And, you know, I promote problem solving in my class. We're problem solvers at LaDonna. And Willem. Willem Davies is a very promising, kind, good young man. He looks the he looks part. part. There was a, gosh, what, what, do, you, what do you call it? Uh, a staff, maybe? with a short hiking staff in Mr. McKinley's room that was all splintered and duct taped. It was about the correct way, I assume. So I just used that. It was every Friday. Every week? Yes, after school for a couple hours. So, Ms. Murphy, um, I just wanted to know. You said that earlier that Willem had a different set of instructions for, from the rest of the group? Yes, he did. Can you tell me what exactly everyone was doing? Sure. My parents work in security, so their business is all about strange break-ins or would a criminal do this or do that, so it's not completely important to me. Okay, well, I don't know how familiar you are with the layout of LaDonna, but it's a very small school, and we're in one of the smallest structures on a campus atop this kind of wooded slope, right? It has two classrooms in this one bungalow, a small corridor between them, so Willem approaches from the east and fires a few shots into the air when he's outside the eastern entrance. Then he enters the first classroom, shoots Prince, crosses the corridor, shoots Gabriel, who's standing guard outside the second classroom, kind of 
a martyr figure, if you will. It's during this time that Lourdes, have you met Lourdes? It's during this time that Lourdes hides in the supply closet in the second classroom, so he peeks in there, doesn't see anyone, and he leaves. What happened to them? Then, then he turns turn the, the gun, gun on, on himself. Myself. Did you come up with that? It wasn't hard to. You'll find... You'll find that there's, there's almost an archetype for this now. What do your parents think about this, Lourdes? Excuse me? Your mom and dad. What do they think about rehearsal? Of everyone at LaDonna, I think Lourdes probably needs rehearsal the most. Why? She's different from everyone else. Then there's SWAT team recovery. Who's the SWAT team? Miss Murphy's the SWAT team. She participates? Yeah, that part developed later on. We can do it a few times a Friday usually, and I help them out with logistics sometimes. You did it more than once a day? Well, it doesn't take very long, does it? A space that small, a weapon like that, it doesn't take more than a few minutes. We rehearse it maybe 20 times a Friday. Did you say you give notes? I'm sure the superintendent knows the anxiety these kids are going through. The constant anxiety, even if it's below the surface, even if it's subtle, implied. They need to get it out. They need to get it out. I always, I always think, think about, about it, it. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh. Like, you enter a room and you just think, is that cabinet big enough to fit me? My parents are no money, right? My dad's an entrepreneur. He and my mom came up together. They have like a lot of money, like a lot of money. So they sent me here. Moved out of bad neighborhood, sent me to the school, private school, private school, private school, all my life. And then Mother Visa got shot up. You went there? No, but I could have gone there. I mean, my parents picked LaDonna because it's half a mile closer to our house. That's the only reason. So yeah, I didn't, but I could have. You have to wonder, when something like that happens, what's all the money for? Do you have some kind of opinion on the role you play? I like it. You do? Yes, I like it a lot. I feel like Ms. Murphy's the kind of person who's, um, uh, oh, oh God, what do you call it? Uh, she's, um, uh, she's um, intuitive. Yeah, she's intuitive. Why do you say that? Because I feel like my part makes sense for me. I like to think if something really were to happen, I'd be brave like that. I don't just, I don't know, just, the way our times are, I don't feel like there are opportunities to be brave like that, you know? This is like our only way. Sometimes my mom would stop on Fridays and park outside the school. She knew what we were doing and she'd just sit there and cry, cry for me. There are these big heavy doors at the back of the hall. They take a full three seconds to open and they make a really loud sound. You wouldn't want to use them during a shooting. And there's chicken wire on the windows. That's, That's why, why it, it makes sense, sense that, that no one, one can, can make, make it out. out. Do you... What do you think about your part in this whole sequence? That I survive? <laughs> do you? How does it make you feel that you're the only survivor? Do you think it upsets you? No, it makes sense. Someone has to survive or it's just not the same. Did you ever feel scared, Lourdes? No. We did it so many times and the same thing happened every time. Miss Murphy, say that sometimes she carried you out as SWAT team. Yes, she did sometimes. She'd enter through the west entrance and walk over to me and hoist me off the ground and drag me out by my armpits and lay me down on her table. They're all so committed to it. They want to be doing it as much as I do, and I know. I know some people at the district may ask about it, but it really doesn't distract them from homework. I think it helps, actually. What do you teach? History, mostly. Do you feel that Prince do you feel the, the process of this rehearsal has affected you outside in any way? Nah, not really. Oh, weird dreams, but I've always been a weird dreamer. Weird dreams? Anything concerning? I wouldn't say exactly concerning. Everyone has nightmares. Apparently, most of the dreams we have are nightmares. Apparently, dreams themselves are mostly just expressions of anxiety did have one that shook me up a bit. <sighs> okay. I was on this iceberg somewhere. I think I was a penguin. Anyway, the other penguins around me were clustering. And I knew, I just knew, you know, the way you just know things in dreams. 
at, we had to dive into the water. We were just supposed to. And the water was green, I remember that. We sort of jostled each other to get one of us to be the first to jump in. We finally got this one penguin, a small one, probably a runt. We got him to jump in. We pushed him off, basically, and immediately the water went red. But the thing is, we can smell the blood. It's acrid, really disgusting. We smell it, and we know what it means. But we keep pushing each other into the water anyway. One after the other, do not walk away. We don't see the shark or even movement in the water. Just explosions of blood. And it was really the smell. I felt really weird when I woke up. Then I remembered that I have this at the end of the week, and I felt better. Better. Relieved. Relieved. It feels like a dance. I get up, stand in front of the door, get shot, fall forward. The way me and Willem move around each other is like a dance. Does that make any sense? Why is Lourdes the only one who survives? Someone had to. That much was clear, I think. When it came down to deciding who, well, to be honest, everyone fell pretty naturally into their roles. You look at the components of something like this. Anyway, Lourdes wasn't any exception. She's a shy girl. Very sweet, very smart. She's on scholarship, you know. Her family could never afford to send her here in a million years. Don't you get the feeling when you look at her like she needs, I don't know, that she needs a promise of something? I have a daughter now, actually. Edith, she'll be one in two months. Do you have kids? This isn't. I remember being really scared when she was born. And I remember thinking that that would pass. But it doesn't, really. So this is all to create something helpful? Yes. But why? Why this way? What? Why dying? Why did you create something worthy if I had to die? I'm not sure if I follow. Wouldn't it be better if they survived, if he didn't shoot them? But he does. He does. End of play. Welcome, Welcome to, to America. America, land of routine. Where every 15 minutes, a person is killed with a gun. One minute, be two minutes, three minutes, three minutes four minutes, five minutes, 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 minutes,
Can y'all tell me I'm frustrated? Frustrated for our people, for our men, women, and kids? Many of my people share this frustration, but there's only one person who influences my fr fr frustration further. Hey, little man, I'll be back in a few. I got a few pounds to sell. Tell mama I love her. My big brother, Levon Tavius, also known as Tay Sticks in the Streets. At home, we call him Tay. As for little man, that's his name for me. But my birth name is Nehemiah. Mama always said that Nehemiah means God has comfort. Nehemiah also helped to rebuild Judaism. She also told me my birth is what she hopes to be, she hoped would be the same for our family, rebuilt it, especially after she was aware of Tay's interesting hobbies and dad left us. Tay's dealing and banging scared mama just like a napping head to a comb. He always told me to tell her he loved her. He said that that's what he wanted mama to remember him saying, just in case, you know, he wouldn't come home that night. Where is that darn brother of yours? And get that jacket off the floor. Tuck that shirt in and please, son, brush that nappy head of yours. No human alive needs to see the beady beads on the back of your neck. Lock the door when I leave and wash them dishes. Love you too. That's mama. <laughs> she worked two full-time jobs and just doesn't know when to stop working. Glass breaking and yelling heard off stage. Goon enters, he grabs younger Nehemiah by the collar. Where's that snitch brother of yours? Uh, I'm not. Answer me. He went to sell somewhere, I don't know. So, huh? That's what he been doing? It's funny how all that money suddenly went missing. Now tell me where the money at. Uh, I don't know nothing about no money. So I guess you don't know how Big Smokey got locked up? What? Your brother messed up real bad, Lil Tay. Snitching, messing around with my money, and he's as good as dead if you don't tell me where that money is, aight? I, I... Just like your brother, huh? Clueless. Play for your brother, dog. He gon' need it. Goon runs off, leaving younger Nehemiah on the ground, shaken. Little, little Tay. Tay. First time I realized that in the streets, I was just Leaf Ontavius, a little brother that was posed to keep up where he is and what he's doing or what money he got. At home, I'm the glue to this family. But when I'm on the other side of that door, I'm suddenly the heir to the throne, except to carry my brother's legacy. The goons appear with Leon Tavius in a headlock. Close by is Andre, his friend, held at gunpoint. Young Nehemiah gets to his feet. Tay, Tay! Hey, little man, back up. I got this. Dre, tell him. Hey, little man, go on back home, too. Shut up for I put a bullet in you, snitch. And your little homie, too. Hey, man, leave my people out of this, all right? Where'd that money at? Cough it up, or we're gonna have to make you. I swear on my life, I don't got no money. Check, check, with the plug, I gave it to him. You got three seconds to either tell me where the money at or we gonna take it out your pocket. I ain't got enough. Three. I, I chill, I told you the money ain't with me. Two. Hey man, I ain't got the money. One. Look man, I- A gunshot rings out. Leontavius stretches his left hand up towards the sky and places his right hand over his chest where he's been shot. He and Andre freeze in place. It killed mama that day she found out. Five days straight, she cried. Felt like five years. Leontavius exits. Andre stands at a distance. With Tay gone, Mama lost her firstborn, her protector, her heartbeat. With Tay gone, I lost my protection, my best friend, my influence. With Tay gone, the world lost- The flickering light of a TV screen washes over them. An African-American male and possible new gang member was shot and killed by a group of thugs yesterday afternoon at 6175 Newsbark Avenue. In other news... Thug? Gang member? He was my brother. Her son. My mother used to tell me that there were going to be people like the boys who killed my brother whenever we went. But to always keep on a smile on our face, she would tell us that we were going to be alright and never let anyone or anything destroy the brightness that our future was to become. Every night we would hear this, I remember the moment so vividly. Like she was cradling me and my sister while she sang a sweet song. Every now and again, I hear her song, the same way she would sing it to us in that very moment. Two black sons, one black daughter. What does that mean to you? To me, it means three college tuitions, three plates to fix, three mouths to feed, three coats to buy, then wash, then dry. To them, it means three more criminals labeled guilty from the day they were born three more gangsters, three more ghetto pants sagging, weave bad and no daddy having loud math black kids. And I can't put up with that anymore. Why? Because I raised my kids right. I taught them to respect their elders, to keep their pants above their waistline, 
and they might not have a pop father, but they dang sure had a black mother who didn't need any man to tell her to what to do. I am a black woman standing on the shoulders of my ancestors who built this land we live in now. Don't forget where you came from. Just because in these times we're not accepted, remember where you started, where we started, where America started. But most importantly, don't ever underestimate the power of a black woman. My mom always told me that love is the center of the earth, but sometimes like a donut, we lose our center. Psst, hey man, I saw those clowns with pop tape right behind the school, buy those apartments over there. Wanna come with me getting respect back? Listening to Andrea, I was conflicted with myself. Would I continue to live up to mama's intention and be the rebuilder of this family, or would I do as expected and live up to the title of little Tay? Didn't you hear me, man? Don't you wanna get back at him? I knew exactly what he meant. The feeling of consistent anticipation came and then went. I'm usually too slow to anger and hesitate to quit. But then I thought of my, my brother. brother. I knew that this was it. Not thinking of the pain I would inflict it on. Your my mother. My mother. Or the way I would eventually end up just like my, my brother. brother. All those thoughts were irrelevant and I had a sudden thought. To avenge my brother's death despite the things my mother taught? Be careful with your anger, for it will eventually reveal the things you want to do before you've had the time to heal. Looking back at these feelings never failed to make me cringe. I follow the voice of Andrea, the voice of revenge. revenge. After school, 10 o'clock. We walked onto the property of Head Heights apartment complex. I see them. I see Andre, I see the pistol. Nothing else is on my mind but giving those suckers what they deserve, exactly what they gave my brother. Then I thought, what would I gain? What emotions would overcome other than regret and remorse? What would my mother think if I destroyed someone else's life just like how my family was destroyed? I could choose revenge. But I choose love, growth. And a future for people that look like me. People marked as dead from the day they were born. People who could change the world for the better. I choose my community. I choose victory. I choose progress. I choose- How long have you been standing there? Excuse me? Policeman enters. This is private property, what are you doing? Uh, get down on the ground. I said get on the ground. Sir, I think you got the wrong person. I haven't done anything against the law. Put your hands above your head and get on your knees, now. Can I turn up? Shut up and just do it. Please don't shoot me, please. Shut your mouth. Why are you detaining me? I've done nothing wrong. You got the wrong guy. I promise my mother I will come home and... Stop resisting. I'm not. Policeman pulls his gun out and points it at younger Nehemiah. Didn't you just hear me? Please, please, I have a family, my mother, my little baby sister, I have school of future, life of value. I, I, I don't wanna die, please. Read my lips, watch your tongue. I had enough of your people torturing this town and causing chaos. What, you people? You know what, I know my rights. He pulls out his cell phone and starts recording. Please put the phone down. I have rights too, sir, I can't die, Shut please. it, boy. Why can't y'all just see that we're all not criminals? We are not defined by the color of our skin. Why am I always guilty because of the God-given color of my skin? Be quiet. Please, I have, a, I have to be there for Hush. my family. Mama, mama, please, I don't wanna. A gunshot rings out. Younger Nehemiah stretches his left hand up towards the sky. He freezes and the policeman disappears. Unlike Tay, I survived. I was lucky. It's bullshit what passes for luck these days. It's bullshit that since the beginning, I failed to realize that this country wasn't founded to include in me and its liberty and justice for all. It's bullshit that never, that Tay never got the justice and liberty that he was promised in the Constitution. Mama either. The question I ask myself every day and I ask you. What does my past tell you about me? When you glance at my outward appearance, what do you see? Someone who has been hurt by the loud crack of a gun or the straight A students who would eventually become someone Someone to linger in the enclosed wall of gang violence, or the boy who would eventually be complied with the silence of the hallways when I walked into my next class. Do I deserve to be just because of my irreversible past? I know who I am, I know who I will become, but you can only see the newspaper article positioned with the image of the gun. Looking past the baseball awards and honor roll certificates, but to the peers around me, it shows no significance. But when you look at my life, you really don't see, because my past does not tell you what you need to know about me. With liberty and justice for, for. End of play.
Welcome, Welcome to America, America, land of the free, home of the brave. Where every 15 minutes a person is killed with a gun. One minute, Welcome to two America. minutes, black, three minutes, like four Brian minutes, five minutes, man, six don't minutes, shoot, seven shoot, minutes, repeat, eight and minutes, repeat, nine repeat, minutes, repeat, minutes repeat, ten repeat, minutes, repeat, minutes, eleven son. minutes, twelve, I was innocent. thirteen young. minutes, fourteen minutes, fifteen minutes. I wish I could protect him. Don't Why am I always guilty because of the God-given color of my skin? In My Sights, Tain Lenar, by Tain Leonard Peck. Setting, an assorted setting in America, present day. Internally a ruined home, the gun enters, et enters and stands center stage. So, I think you're all curious about my point of view. Might as well start at the beginning. Like everyone else, I was born, went from darkness to light. Ironic, given how everything turned out, but that's for later. I was made in a little workshop in Missouri. The South is known for its gun manufacturing, but this shop produced unique made-to-order weapons, revolvers, shotguns, and semi-automatics like me. I felt like there was more heart put into my creation than a thousand cookie-cutter guns turned out on some assembly line. Ugh. I thought I was special. As for who made me, well, he's one of the most amazing men on this green earth. He has to be. He's my dad. Bill, his name tag said. Day after day, he put together handguns. He had a real passion for it, too. Switch this spring for an alloy model, and I'll be able to put a few more pounds of trigger pressure, make it harder for the gun to accidentally discharge. And there we go. That's Bill. <laughs> Funny thing was, he didn't even really like shooting guns. He just liked the puzzle of putting something mechanical together. He had other motivations, too. All these new commissions are lifesavers. I gotta pay for Christmas, a bike for my daughter, and a new phone for my son. My wife deserves something, too, so anything for my family. Bill brought me home as a side project, so I got to know all about him. Honey. I know you don't like it when I bring work home. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. Look, there's not even a firing pin in it yet. I'll keep it out of reach for our kids when I'm not working on it, I promise. I never let anything happen to our kids. Amazing man, right? I haven't even heard him swear. But that isn't to say his life was perfect. He had his issues. I said it's safe, now please let me work in peace. She doesn't understand how guns work. I know what I'm doing. Most of the time, Bill was happy with his job. But every once in a while, he had moments of doubt. He saw things on the news or in the papers, and they hurt him. All those poor kids, their families. So, he gave himself a lot of pep talks. I make handguns and shotguns, not rifles. The paper said that the shooter used an AR-styled rifle. Our shop doesn't produce those. This is my fault, not my fault at all. He always pulled himself out of his funk. Told himself that no matter how many times a gun was used to hurt someone, there were other times that firearms had been used to protect lives. And he thought he had added me to that list of guns that protect people. I have a 45 that fits the order. Just finished then. Off you go to your happy new home. And that was the last I saw of Bill, son of a gun maker. <laughs> I was all grown up. He packed me, wished me good luck, and shipped me off to my happy new home. I felt, I don't know, scared and excited all at once. I didn't know where I was going or who I was going to. But turns out I got really lucky with Lana and Michelle. Lana and Michelle enters. Standing near a high counter, Lana walks over to the gun and puts her arm around it. Well, here you are. After all that talk about protecting ourselves, I can't believe we finally have this thing. You don't need to say this thing like it's a wild animal, Shelly. It's a gun. It's a tool. What? You mean like a freaking screwdriver? Exactly. Take some shooting classes with me one of these days. It's not going to be much help to have a pistol for self-defense if I'm the only one who can use it. I 
No, it just feels weird owning a weapon. I grew up in the suburbs. We didn't have crime when I was a kid. Yeah, and last week your mom and dad had an attempted break-in. I know, but having a gun feels wrong. I don't like what it represents. What does it represent? That things have changed so much that we're scared. If you're not scared nowadays, you're not paying attention. Look, if someone tries breaking down our door, I don't want to be stuck hoping the police can reach us fast enough if the police even bother showing up. Now you're just being cynical. Maybe. The news doesn't paint a pretty picture of the boys in blue now, does it? Lana was wonderful. A really responsible gun owner. Took great care of me, never went for any of the cheap ammo. Shelly never really warmed up to me, though. She did get some target practice in eventually. Grew to enjoy range shooting over time. Even started taking home her shot up targets. But there was always some hesitancy. She never really truly seemed happy to have me in the house. Well, her fear seemed justified in the end. Lights up on L Lana, Lana and Michelle sitting at a kitchen table. Michelle slaps a letter down on, on the table between them. That's it? We're moving. We can't. We don't have the money for it right now. And besides, we'll be fine. We won't be fine. We got another letter. Last time it was just insults. This time they said they'd set our apartment on fire. It's an empty threat, Shelly. Relax. Remember what happened to Marco from the other floor? He got beaten to a pulp in the parking lot after some guy saw him kiss his boyfriend. We aren't okay here. I'm armed. So? He wasn't. If anyone tries to attack you or attack me or burn our place down, they'll get what's coming to them. And what happens if you do shoot someone? I know you talk about self-defense and your gun safety courses, but the law is messy. Do you want to risk a murder conviction because you shot someone instead of running away? Do you want to risk losing me while you do life in prison? I just want us to be safe. I want to take care of you, of us. Look, we can't move right now, but we can look into it. I could work overtime, maybe take a loan, something, anything, whatever you really need. Lana Michelle exits. I really wanted to help them, to keep them safe. But Shelly was right. Using me was a risk. Maybe they'd successfully defend themselves. Maybe they'd go to jail. At worst, I meant death. Lana and Shelly weren't happy about it, but they scraped together the money to move to another neighborhood, one that had less risk of being attacked or harassed. But moving day had its own risks. It was all too easy for someone to make off with something important or, or something dangerous. Someone saw the moving truck and broke into the house when Lana and Shelly ran out for coffee. I was still in my drawer next to Lana's side of the bed. From there on out, things went bad, very bad. Hey, turn around! Please bring me back home to Lana and Shelly. After all, no reasonable person wants to be caught with a stolen handgun. Alex and Charlie enter. We hear them before we see them. Oh, this car is such a mess. All right, we gotta throw out all our wrappers before we leave. Whose fault is that? Who wanted two burgers and a large fries at the drive-thru? Yeah, I feel like how bad a mistake that was. You made your bed. I'm getting a slushie. You just had to go to the burger place that doesn't serve them. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can I just hope they have antacids or something. Can you get me some? Alex laughs and then abruptly goes quiet when he spots the gun. Charlie notices it too. They both raise their hands. The gun approaches them with slow, jerky movements as if it's not in control. Hey, 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 take it easy. I'm sorry, I can't stop. Please don't hurt us, we'll give you everything. Alex and Charlie empty their pockets onto the ground and at the gun's feet. The gun keeps coming. God, please don't kill us. It's not me, I don't have a choice. The gun continues to approach them, now raising its arms in front of them itself, palms facing Alex and Charlie. We gave you everything we have, just please take it and go. Take the car too if you want. The gun is almost close to touch Charlie and Alex. I wish I could help you, I wish I could protect you too, I'm so sorry. The gun pokes Alex and Charlie in the chest with a single finger each. They slump to the ground. We've been shot. Someone help, call the cops. Stay calm, babe, just hold on. It hurts, Charlie, please hold my hand. I got you, Alex, just need to, just need to reach my phone. Alex and Charlie moan and then collapse flat on the ground. They are silent now. The gun takes a few steps downstage. Senseless. It's pointless. They did everything he asked. He tossed me in some drain. 
The police found me. They checked my serial number and had Lana and Shelly brought in. Now all that fear Shelly had was justified. Look at what I did. Lana Michelle enters, holding hands. They had reported me stolen. Once the investigation's done, I should be able to go home. If anyone still wants me home. Bill enters. Lots of people don't get to go home. I don't know what happened to Charlie and Alex, but I hope they survived. I can't bear the thought of causing innocent people to suffer. Guns are a lot of things. We're tools, we're weapons, and we're symbols. I can make someone feel like an artist from how they design and assemble guns to how they can shoot with absolute precision. I can make people feel safe, like they have nothing to be afraid of at night. Or I can make them feel scared. I can make them feel helpless and powerless. I can make them feel pain. I can make them bleed and I can make them die. The gun kneels on the edge of the stage. It makes me want to destroy myself. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Curtain, end of play. Welcome, Welcome to, to America. America. One, two, Land three, four, and five, six, seven, minutes, eight, a nine, ten, eleven, twelve, gun. thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Salted Lemonade by Taylor Lafayette. Setting, Lisa's house in a small southern Georgia town on the night of Thanksgiving. Jamal, Jackie, and Lisa sit around a small square table where Thanksgiving food is placed. The table is decorated in an orange tablecloth with blue plates and napkins. A single pitcher of lemonade rests in the middle of the table next to the Thanksgiving food. Jamal gets a text message alert and rises to get up before Lisa stops him. Ma. Don't mommy, boy. Now, where do you think you're going? The boys just texted me. They want me to go riding with them. Boy, it's Thanksgiving. Since you turned 18, you don't just ask your mama permission to leave, huh? That's right. Get them, Lisa. Everyone want to be grown till it's time to pay some bills. Ain't that the truth? Mm. How long are you going to be out? And are you driving or are you riding with somebody? Mama, I don't know. It's just me and the boys, and I'm going riding. Anybody riding with you? These roads unusually slick for this time of year. Drive careful, if she lets you go. Come on, Auntie, you too old to be a childish. Girl, I know he did not just call you old. I think he did. Bet he won't repeat it. <laughs> he ain't ready for you, Jackie. Let my baby live. He just turned 18. He don't know how we used to get down. <laughs> you ain't lying. He just don't know. Mama, can I go or not? You know, I usually would let you go, but it was a shooting down there where I know y'all be hanging, and I just don't want nothing to happen to you, JJ. Mama, you know me and my friends not even like that. Besides, shootings are happening everywhere. JJ, if you're trying to get out in them streets tonight, you might want to leave out the shooting. Jackie, hush. I'm not worried about y'all, Jamal. I know y'all good boys. The boys who got shot last week was good boys. Bullets don't discriminate. It's Thanksgiving, Ma. I don't even think anybody should even be on that tonight. I think he should be safe, Lisa. He's a smart boy. See, auntie think it's okay. Whose side are you on, Jackie? All right, fine, you can go but you better be back in this house no later than 12.30, Jamal Jennings. Do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. 12.30. Do you need some money? Girl, the boy's birthday was yesterday. He got enough money to last in the next two weeks. You're right, you're right. Hey, Jamal, don't take all that money with you either. Leave some here. I know, mama. I'm just making sure. It bums out here taking lives for a nickel. That's true. It was a robbery on Emerson Street last week. A man got held at gunpoint for $50. $50, child? The world is getting crazier day by day. Nothing like when we was kids. Sad, sad truth. You listen here, JJ. Be careful. 
Watch out for your surroundings and your friends. And yes, you're a man now, but please keep your mother updated. Have fun and be safe. I love you, nephew. Jackie rises and kisses Jamal's forehead. And where are you going, Jackie? Y'all both gonna leave me lonely on Thanksgiving? Girl, I'm going to the bathroom, drinking all that lemonade catching up to me. When I come back, you better be ready to watch them Christmas Hallmark movies. You know it. Now that's gonna get me in the Christmas spirit. Jackie exits. Lisa rises and goes to Jamal. You sure you don't need another jacket? It's pretty cold out, and don't forget your hat. Mama, stop treating me like I'm a baby. I am an adult as of yesterday. Even auntie said it. I can handle myself. As of yesterday is correct, JJ. You are still my baby and my only baby at that. You're all I got left. I just want you to be safe. I know, Ma. You don't need to worry so much, though. I can handle myself and I hear you what you're saying. Just know I ain't going nowhere. But I'll with my boys. I'll see you later and I love you. And tell Auntie to make some more of that lemonade before she leaves. What's with you and that lemonade? Remember when I was little and how me and my cousins would play football all day? That was the referee and we'd play until we get them scratches on our knees. Every time we would come in, on Jackie would have something waiting for us. It reminded me that even when things went sour, something sweet would be waiting in the end. Seems just like yesterday. Where is the time gone? Time ain't gone nowhere, Ma. Can you promise me something? Yes, baby. Don't worry, okay? I'll be back at 12.30. And please, don't let Auntie forget about that lemonade. Jamal exits after kissing Lisa's cheek, just as Jackie enters. He left yet? He just left. You did a good job, Lisa. A good job with what? Raising that boy. Especially after, well, you know. I know why you worry about him so much. I just don't want him to leave me. He's grown and he's gonna wanna live a life of his own. He's gonna think you don't need his mama's protection because that's for little boys. Honestly, Jackie? I've been scared since midnight struck yesterday. I've been keeping this big smile on my face, cooking his favorite meals, buying that stupid gaming system he won't shut up about. But Jackie, I'm scared. I'm not scared of the man he's becoming, but the world he's becoming it in. Lisa, sis, you have every right to feel that way, especially after Miles died. I can't promise you that the world is gonna change overnight, but you have to have faith, you hear me? I know, but... Ever since that night, I, I got that call saying Miles had been shot, and the only thing I could think was, what if this would happen to JJ? Every time he takes a step out that door, my mind goes there. I know I can keep him safe here, but there ain't no guarantee he's gonna be safe out there, Jackie. I know I shouldn't feel this way, but I do. He's not a boy anymore, Jackie. He's a man, and he's gonna wanna do things that men do. And something as simple as a store run could have him in the wrong place at the wrong time. Enough! You're overthinking this, Lisa. You've raised a brilliant young man with a bright future who reached 18 without being in these streets. As a black mother, you should feel proud. Thank you. Why are you being so nice to me? What do you want? I've been fiending to get my hands on that apple pie you garden. You, <clears throat> I've been waiting since Jamal walked out that door. You know if he was here, it would have been gone before it hit the plate. He loves those pies just like his lemonade. Speaking of, my baby asked for someone he gets back, so don't forget. Stop calling that baby a boy. Please. <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm gonna make some for I join you. If there's any left. All I know is when I come back, it better be some left over for me. I don't mind calling mama. Girl, you are too old to be telling mama on me. I already know I'm getting my ways anyway, I'm the baby. Girl, I'm not stunting you. I'm about to go make this lemonade and it better be some left when I get back. Well, we'll see when you get back. Jackie scowls at Lisa as she exits. Lisa laughs. Where the lemons at? Should be on the second shelf in the fridge. Mmm, Jackie put her foot in this, yes, Lord. Lisa's cell phone rings. Now, who is this? Lisa checks her phone. She doesn't recognize the number. Lisa silences her phone and puts it face down. Jackie enters and notices the big slice of pie Lisa has. So, you just gonna take all the pie like that? You thought I was playing? Ain't no way you done with that lemonade, Jackie. No, but I've been craving that pie, so I'm back. Got plenty of time to make it. Lisa, 
When was the last time you went out? Um, whenever we last went out for drinks. Why? Girl, when's the last time you went out with someone besides me? You know, for like a girl's night, a date maybe. Stop being nosy. It's none of your business. It is my business if your only social time is spent with your sister and your son. See, now what we ain't finna do. Jackie's cell phone rings. Lord, I'm trying to fix my sister's dating life. Jackie checks her phone. Lisa sees the number on Jackie's phone and becomes curious. I don't know this number anyway. Wait, let me see your phone. That looks like the same number that called me. It can't be, but here, knock yourself out. Lisa checks her phone and Jackie's to see that it is the same number. It is the same number, Jackie. I'm calling back. I wonder who it is. That's weird. Lisa calls the number on her phone and it just rings. They're not answering, Jackie. I don't like this. You try to call. I'm not calling that number. If you want it called, you do it. You just overreacting again, girl. I will. I got a bad feeling about this. Lisa calls the number back on Jackie's phone. It goes to voicemail. Lisa begins to panic. Jackie, they're not answering. What if someone called for Jamal? What if something happened to my baby? Oh, Lord, please let my baby be okay. I gotta go. Jackie, we gotta go. Come on, grab your coat. Let's go. Jackie looks at Lisa, concerned, as Lisa rushes off stage to get her coat. She rushes back on stage with her keys and coat. Lisa, calm down. Jackie, why are you sitting there? I said, let's go. Jackie doesn't move. Fine. If you don't want to, I'll go by myself. Jackie receives a text and te checks it immediately. <sighs> Lisa, check this phone, please. Lisa grabs the phone and reads the text aloud. This Jamal tried to call, couldn't get through on my way home to get a charger. My phone died. Thank God my baby's safe. Lisa puts down her coat and keys. Now don't you feel silly. Running around, acting all crazy. <laughs> Telling me to grab my coat. <laughs> I had to make sure my baby was okay. I texted him that we'll be waiting. Almost made me grab the keys to Nas, the auntie's Nissan. At least he's on his way home. I know he's good when he's here. Ain't that the truth? Have me scared over here. I'm sorry about that. Let's forget that even happened and get back to this pie. Half a beat, then a series of three knocks is heard. I just know that ain't JJ. His ass better not be speeding. Jackie rises to open the door. You getting the door? Yes, hopefully you've been made a dent in your pie by the time I get back. <laughs> Jackie exits. Lisa eats pie, a beat. Jackie! Le JJ, don't y'all be talking about me out there. What are y'all doing? I know I heard the door close. Lisa rises and walks to exit the stage after not getting a response. She gets nearly off stage before she yelps and starts visibly shaking with fear. Put your hands up. I ain't trying to hurt nobody. Lisa walks backwards with her hands up as the gunman points his gun at her, his hand clasped over Jackie's mouth in a headlock position. Lisa halts after reaching center stage. Sir, please walk by faith. I promised my son we'd be here when he came. I promised him he's safe here. Please don't hurt us. Shut it, lady. Get on your knees, both of y'all. Gunman throws Jackie to the ground as Lisa drops to her knees and helps her. He waves his gun at them to move. Now! Jackie and Lisa both cry, sitting on their knees in front of the gunman with their hands raised. Please walk by faith, please. Gunman points the gun at her as the lights dim and the curtain closes. End of play. Welcome to America, land of sweet and sour. Where every 15 minutes, hey, yo, time again. One, two, can we catch three, a break? When four, can anyone five, get a break around six, here? Seven, can you just stop ticket for one second? Time 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But we can't. Time ain't gonna stop until, until somebody, somebody says, says enough. enough. It's okay by Anya Jimenez. Setting a barren landscape in an unknown time. In darkness. We hear noise, lots of it. The insides of a grieving brain are dumped out onto a stage in the form of a wall of sound, replaying memories and sound bites simultaneously, endlessly, until it ends. A single spotlight breaks the darkness, illuminating Mother, a middle-aged woman, whose shaky breath is the only thing breaking the silence. The chair she sits in looks very worn, like a hard plastic chair you'd find in an ele elementary school or middle school. When a, then a youthful sounding voice. It's okay. It'll be okay. Hello? Hi. Who are you? 
Secret? What? It's a secret. I can't see you. That's okay. No, it's not. Where are you? Here. That's not what I mean. I'm here. I'm serious. So am I. Jesus Christ, can you just tell me where you are? No. Then stay away from me because... <laughs> I'm not here to hurt you. Can I see you? Please. What do I look like? What? What do you want me to look like? Well, I don't want you to look like anything but... Then I don't. Don't what? Look like anything. You're safe. Pinky promise. Mother pauses and softens. She gives up on the conversation partially because she knows it'll just keep going in circles and partially because she feels some slight inexplic inexplicable feeling of comfort. She wipes her eyes and readjusts in her chair. The light shifts, a school bell sounds. It's been slightly distorted, but it's still recognizable. Parent-teacher conferences are this Thursday. Okay. I feel like I'm supposed to tell you that. Okay. She just reached reading level J, so... She trails off. The school bell plays again. Hello? I'm here. A box of Annie's mac and cheese descends from the sky, floating down to mother, tied to a string. And so is that. I'm sorry, where am I? In a chair. No, I got that. I mean, where? A spoon descends from the sky, also messily tied to a string, on the other side of mother. Mother pauses. Is this for the mac and cheese? Yeah. You can't just eat it straight out the box. You have to cook it. You want me to cook it? No, I'm just saying. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you have to cook the macaroni. With what? A pot, boiling water. Do you want those? No, I'm, no, I'm good, I just... You tie the string yourself? Yeah. Where does it come from? Michael's. You bought the string at Michael's? Yeah. Like the craft store? Yeah. You guys have Michael's down there? No, not down here. But what's it connected to? Oh, it just comes from up. Got it. What else is up there? Whatever you want. I feel like I'm missing something. That's normal. It is? It is. Did something bad happen? You're safe. That's not what I asked. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm not mad at you. I... Thank you. <laughs> what time is it? I don't know how to read clocks yet. What do you mean? The big hands and the little hand. They fall apart when I look. What? I look at the 12 and it hurts. I feel like... Tell me. Tell me. I feel like something is wrong. I can put on some music if that would help you feel better. I don't know what I feel. I... You want to hear me sing? I've, I've heard that before. You've heard me sing? No. The way you said it, I've heard... Lots of people like singing. Mother gets up from her chair. She looks around the room again. Mother becomes more serious. Voice does too, a cross between an apology and a warning. There's not much out there. When did I fall asleep last night? Ten and a half. Ten thirty? No. Ten and a half and eleven in six months. How much more time before I wake up? You can stay as long as you want. I don't want to stay. Do you want to go? I don't know. Okay. Parent-teacher conferences are canceled. Because the school... You should sit back down. Because the school... Please. Sit back down. Because the school shut down. It's okay. The school shut down because... The sound of news clips. It starts off with individual reporters and eventually melds into a cacophony of layered news reports as if someone is gradually raising the volume of an old TV show. Good afternoon, everyone. We are arriving live at the scene of the Dogwood Elementary mass shooting. It is now 2.19 p.m. We are coming on the air at 2.36 p.m. Where the shooter is still at large. And 10 children appear to be in critical condition. Can you condition. turn that off? Breaking news regarding Please? the fatal shooting of seven children as well as three teachers. The shooting motives are currently unknown. Turn it off! Hello? 
More details Hello? to come the fatal. Dead at 10, 26 p.m. But deadly. And three nights ago, I made Dead her mac and cheese. And she went to bed. And a tragic. And Dead woke up. 4.32 a.m. And breathed. And gruesome. And went to school and died. Dead at 8.07 How am I supposed to live with that? The mac and cheese and spoons slowly start ascending. We've counted three individuals on stretchers. Another shooting. It shouldn't have happened. Four individuals. We're running the numbers. Five individuals. Five children. Six children shot and dead. It, shot it shouldn't and have dead, happened. Shot and dead. Another gun. Another shooting. It shouldn't have happened. Thoughts. Prayers. Thoughts. And prayers. Shot and dead. Thoughts and prayers. Shot and dead. Shot and dead. Shot and dead. And again and again and again and again. It shouldn't have happened. The news suddenly stops. The silence is loud. Mother continues speaking, shouting the words out of her system as if they'll kill her if they stay inside of her. And you think about what a body is. When it's in your hands and it used to be her, but now it's it and it's heavy and it doesn't wake up and it shouldn't have happened, but it did. And I'm still here and she doesn't get to be. It just keeps coming. She falls to the floor, buried by the weight of everything. She can't stand, she sobs, then to God or to the voice or to anything that will listen. How long until I wake up? You can take all the time you'll need. She stays like this for a long time. Voice starts humming to her, something comforting adjacent to a nursery rhyme, but not exactly. Voice may pause occasionally in between notes to remember what comes next. Soft and distant, but warm. After a while, mother can breathe again. How many more? Too many. Do you think it ever stops? Is it okay if I don't know? I miss her. She knows. Do you have a name? Tiger. Tiger? A well-loved stuffed tiger rolls to mother's feet in a well-loved stroller or tricycle. If there are tassels, one should be ripped off. Maybe parts of it are discolored or scratched. Anything to indicate that a young child lived with it. She wanted me to say hi. Mother grabs the stuffed animal and hugs it tight. She holds it close to her chest and kisses its forehead. It's okay. It's okay. Knowing that her daughter is with her, the lights go down on mother. Blackout, end of play. Welcome to America, land of dreams, hopes of nightmares, where every 15 minutes, Stop, please. 14, 13, Please, not a reminder 12, of all the time 11. she'll never, the 10 and a half that won't become 11. Just stop, I can't stand the ticking. Southside Summer by Mackenzie Boyd. <laughs> Setting a cemetery. At rise, a cemetery with flowers next to the headstones lights up on Joy and Ava dressed for a funeral. I remember my first summer here on south side of the city. Between the music blaring, car windows, and the police sirens, I was lucky if I could fall asleep and luckier if I could stay asleep. We grew up in Chicago never stayed in one place for too long before we landed on the south side. We traveled from the lube to the back of the yards. I loved seeing the different neighborhoods. I enjoyed seeing the city. I remember going downtown on winter break to get lost in the lights shining from the building on Michigan Avenue. Each light felt like a spirit threaded and weaved into a blanket over its people. But the one sense of familiarity was how we always found that the only thing higher than the skyscrapers was the rent. <laughs> My brother always thought I was funny when I said that. His, His name, name was, was Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Born August 18th, 2009. Black boy, skin as dark as coffee beans and burnt tobacco root. His hair, a jungle gym of knots and coconut oil. Knees, scars and bruised because sometime long ago, he convinced himself that his feet would turn into wings that would take him anywhere if he jumped high enough. A year ago, Emmanuel, Eva, and I settled in a white house with missing shingles and a door that never seemed to lock no matter how hard or how many times we tried. 
It was cheap and dingy, but Manny's eyes lit up each time we drove past it. Emmanuel loved running around with the new, with the new, Emmanuel loved running around the new house, staring at the world out before him. Every day during the summer, he'd watch the kids play. Occasionally, he asked me if he can go outside, though I knew I would say, no, it's not safe, maybe tomorrow. He probably wanted to test his wings, running through the house and jumping down the stairs in hopes of reaching the end without grazing the creaky boards, forever attached to the same painful fate of realizing he, unlike most birds, couldn't fly. Well, at least not high enough to grab the clouds or dunk a basketball. He'd wait outside, stalling his daily chore of taking out the trash, wondering when or how the other boys got their wings, how they learned to fly. I didn't know the kids in my neighborhood too well. I watched them play horse in the street till their hands were dirty with sand and gravel. When the cars came, they'd always sprint to the sidewalk and pretend the ground was lava. <laughs> but one day, they sat on their porch in silence like they really believed it was. The boys were holding back tears for a kid they didn't even know. One of them gave me their sneakers. As strange as it may sound, I held those tattering shoes to my chest, craving the heavenly embrace of their budding wings. I sat and watched the other kids on the block from my window run up and down the street, playing basketball, lighting fireworks, long past any deemable holiday, or walking to the corner store for slushies and candy and nachos, long past when the street lights debuted. I wondered, did their minds ever race? Hands sweat, stomachs churn, and knot themselves? Did they go inside their house and lock their door and unlock it and relock it again just to make sure it was locked the first time? I've messed with the locks till my hands and my lips finally stopped quivering, till I knew whether to run as far as from the door as I could or push up against it in hopes of keeping the madness out. I mean, a shooting happens on the block over, yet they still smile and laugh as if the night will never end, enjoying the music blasting from the cars down the street, not afraid that they'll be caught in the crossfire, which makes me ask, do I need to be afraid? Does, did, Emmanuel need to be afraid? The first gunshot. I can't forget that day, bullets dropping like rain, leaving clouds of smoke over us. So we started our game. The second gunshot. We ducked down behind cars, camouflaging, praying that the lives they claim won't be ours, and the street lights became no man's land, where there's nothing but blood, sand that covers our prayer hands, the young kids that stayed quiet, believing that they were playing hide and seek and tag at the same time. When they heard to run, they dashed, laughing softly to themselves. Some of them would cry, being frightened by the noise, but we knew there was no choice but to wait till we'd be able to rejoice, till they were told the game was over. When minutes unexplainably feel like seconds and days all at the same time, telling a story so purely corrupt that could be told without a spoken word. Manny hid under Mr. Wilson's truck. No one could find him. It was as if his body had become one with the asphalt pressed up against him. The third. I couldn't find him. When the shots seemed like they stopped, I called out his name amid the putrid fog that tainted wisps of air still trapped in my lungs. Emmanuel, Emmanuel? And before my eyes, a shadow rose from the street, dragged by its host to the foreseeable doom. It was Emmanuel. He ran, just like I taught him. I don't quite know if he ever did understand the games we played. Then I saw him, hoping his wings would emerge and carry him to that white house. My breath was no longer rhythmic. It came out in stammers filled with the same panic that pulled Emmanuel into the crossfire. Maybe he thought it was time to test his wings. I never got to ask him that. He was scared. He had to be, yelling and screaming that could be heard from a mile away until another bullet ripped through the blue to challenge the beaming sun and steal the breath from under it all. I plugged my ears when I heard them scream. I could hear footsteps coming near the car as if to mock our fear, as if to frighten us even more. And then he, he was there, stalking the block like the Grim Reaper with faint static through his radio. He was a bounty hunter in search of black souls to petrify while he laughs in our faces, tears in our eyes. I yelled to him, get down, Manny, get down. 
Here lies a story from our black youth for Emmanuel and every other brown-skinned baby put to death with a gun to his head rather than books in his hands, fingertips against a dashboard rather than a blackboard, be treating like the main attraction when he should be adding fractions, dividing and subtraction. This country leaves black boys going to more funerals than birthdays than they said he was resisting. When he was just insisting that he's just a black man in America, the land of the free. When instead he's been shackled from his neck to his feet, seeing if he could deplete the number of black babies meeting their bittersweet relief, spend more, di spend more time praying on their knees, making their final pleas when they should be out there getting their degrees. His death was unjustified, blood dried where they collide on our porch side, where his mama cried and screamed, God, why? When her baby boy's feet was sealed and my mom I can hear her curse herself. Every day she opens that door, a tear would fall from her eyes, feeling as though she had been euthanized, paralyzed, petrified, terrified them. Because now our hearts race, keeping pace to face the unforgiving, unloving, deceptive world that would make her kids cry the same way she did, or worse, fight back the same way she wanted to. They deny and deny his death worldwide without a sliver of repentance his melanin convicted a premature death sentence. Cause they, until they stop, things will never change. Mistake a playground for a gun range, unleashing a rampage till the courtroom becomes their center stage where the crocodile teos will keep them from the cage. A historical pattern in this day and age, read the same old book, but read the same damn page. They need field trips and play dates, not Uzis and AKs. My brother didn't deserve it, he, None of them did, and I raised my voice because you need to understand and listen to my demands. Please, listen, listen to, me. to me. He just kept running towards that stupid white house, and I don't know how, why, or maybe I do and can't accept that this was my fault. It was my fault. I told him to run, I did, oh God, I did. I made him believe that he had wings, that they would take him anywhere he need to go, that they would protect him runs over and holds Ava as she collapses, consumed with sadness and anger. And he just threw him to the ground like he was just, just another, another black, black boy. boy. Slug life. Like a cancer, the bigger the barrel, the more terminal, the everyday feeling of your morality walks beside you as you try to hide from the danger cries and lies of life itself, not knowing if the world's slimy and calloused hands will put you in its embrace and steal you from the world that didn't love you anyway. I remember when he, he said, put, put your, your hands, hands up. up. He said, don't, don't move or out. No, 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 no. He wasn't resisting. Stop resisting. He would never take a stand six feet deep in the land. They didn't even say, say his, his name. name. They called him a casualty. They said our case was time consuming. Too expensive. Probably wouldn't win anyway. Worthless, Manny, my boy, my angel. Come home. I know he can't. Or maybe he can. Maybe he finally grew his wings. Mom cries every day now, staring at the spot in the streets where her baby's body lay. I'm jealous that the pavement got to cradle my baby in his dying breath instead of me. My baby died in a casualty a nameless corpse forever damned to stalk heaven, not knowing the name we bless and call out or wave to us on every birthday that this world stole from him, not knowing that his name will be trapped within our lungs, aching and constricting when we dare utter, Emmanuel. He can't tell us he loves us too. Black boy, skin as dark as gunpowder, blood as thick as thin can leave the body, painfully slow. Black hair mixed with coconut oil and gravel. Shirt stained with a red mess that may never be removed. Eyes forever closed. Our black boy. Why? And now I see Emmanuel downtown amongst the lights in his beaming glory, adding a new thread to the quilt of spirits. Maybe, maybe to shield the others and give them the chance to understand what he wasn't allowed to in his last South Side summer. Joy and Ava place the, the shoes by the headstones next to the flowers. Blackout, end of play. Okay. 
Welcome, Welcome to, to America, America. Land, land of sunrises and suns, where every 15 minutes a person is killed with a gun. One, no two, happy three, end. four, two, five, two words, six, seven, three words. Eight, I love nine, you. His name ten, was. His 11, name 12, was a. Thirteen, fourteen. His name was Emmanuel. Undo Redo by Cameron Thesings. Setting, a locker line school hallway. Listen, it's a cute outfit. Believe me, would I steer you wrong? Well, you let me wear those leggings with Justin Bieber's face all over them in the fifth grade. <laughs> Oh my God, those were hilarious. <laughs> that was my all-time low. I wear better outfits in kindergarten. Okay, well, to be fair, I was, everyone was obsessed with him in fifth grade, so I wasn't really steering you wrong. But I'm telling you, that outfit will be perfect for tonight. Ooh, about that. My dad just told me he has to work tonight, so we don't have a ride to the tailgate. <laughs> what? But this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> it's not every day an underclassman gets invited to a senior tailgate. I know, it sucks. I was really looking forward to it. <sighs> well, could your mom take us? She's got tennis, she can't. <sighs> but that tailgate sounds so fun. Uh, could one of your parents take us? Maybe? They'll probably just complain about my grades if I try to ask them. Past Caroline searches for a pencil in her locker, and Rachel hears a shout. She looks stage left. Dude, who is that kid? Hmm? Gunman enters stage left. We can't quite make out his face, but he doesn't fit the trench coat wearing trope. He looks like any normal kid. That kid? Why is he? Oh, God. Gunman raises his arms as if he's holding a gun that we don't see, aiming at an unseen student. What, is he cute? No, Caroline, there's, he is. Rach? Past Caroline closes the locker door as she looks, goes to look. The gunman suddenly changes directions and focuses his attention to Rachel. He points his arms towards Rachel and Rachel turns back towards past Caroline as they're almost face to face. A low rumble, the lights flicker and then. Stop! The lights stop flickering but are different. Past Caroline, Rachel, and the gunman assume neutral poses. Present Caroline enters. She's wearing the same clothes as past Caroline, but her clothes are rumbled and there are bloodstains on them. She stands at a distance, surveying the scene. Right there. Stop. All right, let's see. We're gonna change this up. Undo. The gunman exits. Past Caroline, Rachel resets to just before the gunman enters. Past Caroline, at her open locker, Rachel standing stage left of her with her back to the gunman. Maybe, let's try this. This time, Caroline, you step away from the locker. Stand in front of Rachel instead. Start from, well, could your mom take us? Past Caroline steps away from her locker and in front of Rachel, now blocking Rachel's view of stage left. Ready? And? Redo. Lights shifts as they were at the top. Well, could your mom take us? She's got tennis, she can't. Ugh, but this tailgate sounds so fun. Could one of your parents take us? Maybe. They'll probably just complain about my grades if I try to ask them. Past Caroline moves away from Rachel and to her locker and searches for a pencil. Rachel hears a shout, she looks stage left. Dude, who is that kid? Hmm? Gunman enters stage left. That kid, why is he, oh God. Gunman raises his arms, aiming at an unseen student. What, is he cute? No, Caroline, there's, he's. Rach? Past Caroline closes the locker door as she goes to look. Again, the gunman suddenly changes directions and focuses his attention on Rachel. He points his arms towards Rachel. Rachel turns back towards past Caroline and they're almost face to face. A low rumble, the lights flicker, and then... Stop! Lights shift. They're reverted to neutral, and will continue to do so on this command. No! You're doing it wrong. You aren't supposed to move. You're, you've got to listen. Undo. The gunman exits. Rachel and past Caroline go back to their starting positions. 
Oh, we'll try this again. We've got to change it. Caroline, you start in front of her again. No more in front. You've got to block her. To the left. No, no, listen to me. Present Caroline enters the scene. She guides past Caroline to the place where she wants her. Here, in front of her. She makes another adjustment to pass Caroline's position. There. Don't move. Start again from dude, who's that kid? And one more thing, this time, this time, go to my locker. Don't go to my locker at all. Redo. Lights go back to normal. Dude, who is that kid? Hmm? Gunman enters stage left. That kid, why is he, oh God. Gunman raises his arms, aiming at a student we cannot see. What, is he cute? No, Caroline, there's, he's rich? Then Rach, Rachel hastily steps around past Caroline to point at the gunman, causing past Caroline to drop her things. The gunman changes directions. He's faster this time, focuses on Rachel. He points his arms towards Rachel. Rachel turns to past Caroline face to face. Rumble, flicker, then... Stop! No! You can't move! You're doing it wrong. It's all wrong! It's supposed to work. Undo. Undo! They do, as they have before. Present Caroline thinks intently. I have to try something else. Something different. We've got, we've got to get away. This time, I spot him first. And then, and then, you run. Redo. What the... Who's that? Who's who? Gunman enters. Rach, Rach, we've got to get out of here. What? What are you talking about? Past Caroline leaves her locker open and grabs Rachel's arm. Rachel doesn't move, confused. He's, he's got, we've got to run. Gunman turns, points. Present Caroline and Rachel are face to face. Terrible rumble, flicker. You've got to run. You've got to. Stop, 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 stop. Shit. Shit. Why? Just undo. Undo, undo, undo. Same way, all right? Same way. It's not that hard. Just fucking run, okay? Redo. What the? Who's that? Who's who? Gunman enters. Rach, Rach, you've got to get out of here. What? What are you talking about? Present Caroline grabs Rachel again. They try to run, but Rachel quickly stumbles and falls. He's got, he's got a, Rachel! Gunman turns, points at Rachel, Caroline, face to face, rumble, flicker. S stop! Why doesn't it, why? Nothing works, nothing works. Something has to. All right, Rachel, you, you need to move back to the other side and stay there. Do you understand? Uh, you can't move from where Rachel spots him again. Undo. They begin to reset. Rachel doesn't go to the other side of past Caroline and instead resets to her original position. Rachel, what are you doing? That's not where I told you to go. Rachel does not listen. Rachel, come on. Rachel proceeds and nods to listen. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> we'll try something else, since you won't just fucking listen to me. Fuck. What is it, what is it? Fine, fine. Fine. If we're really going to change this, we need to... Caroline, you see him first. Then run, run at him, run right the fuck at him, distract him, throw off his aim, scare him, all right? And go from further back, all the way back to the part about mom and tennis, all right? Redo. Well, could your mom take us? She's got tennis, she can't. <sighs> but that tailgate sounds so fun. I know. Could one of your parents take us? Maybe. 
they'll probably just complain about my grades if I try to ask them. Past Caroline reaches for something in her locker, but then hears something stage left. Gunman enters. Carol? That kid. He... Oh, God. Run, everyone, run! She drops her things and takes off towards the gunman, but instead of focusing on past Caroline, the gunman turns and aims Rachel again. Quick rumble, flicker, then... Stop! What the fuck? Present Caroline ang angrily storms on stage, directly headed towards the gunman. No, 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 no! You can't... You can't just... I'm right here! I'm right fucking here! Why are you shooting at her? You can't do that! She pushes him, but he doesn't move, doesn't react. She tries to pull his arm and gets him to aim on past Caroline. Instead, he won't budge. Stop fucking... God, move! More pushing, he won't move. Move, I said... She sinks to the floor. I said move. Aim at me. At me. I'm here, not Rachel. Why won't you... I need this to work, and nothing is working. I need, please work. Not Rachel, please. Present Caroline softly sobs. Everyone else waits for their command. I'm sorry. They reset on their own this time. Present Caroline remains collapsed on the ground. Well, could your mom take us? She's got tennis, she can't. <sighs> but that, that tailgate, tailgate sounds, sounds so fun. fun. Could one of your parents take us? Maybe, Maybe they'll, they'll probably, probably just complain about my grades if I try to ask them. Past Caroline searches for a pencil in her locker and Rachel hears a shout. She looks stage left, present Caroline watches Rachel. Dude, who is that kid? Hmm? Gunman enters. That kid, why is he, oh. God. Gunman raises his arms, aiming at a student we cannot see. What, what is, is he, he cute? cute? No, Caroline, there's, he's... Past great. Caroline is gone. Only present Caroline remains. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... Rich? Present Caroline, present Caroline closes the locker door and the sound is almost deafening. Reacting to the sound of the locker door closing, the gunman methodically changes directions and focuses his attention on Rachel. He points his arm towards Rachel. Rachel turns back towards present Caroline. A low rumble grows. They stay face to face as the light flicker. For a second, it feels like it's, the only, it's only two of them, eye to eye. I'm sorry. Gunshot, blackout, end of play. Hey, it's been 15 minutes. Time to move on. Hello, it, it's been 15 minutes. Can't I just have 15 more minutes? I mean, I might... I That's can't. not how time works. I have to start counting again. Everyone's already... What? Already forgotten? Welcome to America, land of... Land of... I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right Their Wrongs by Wynne Elise Thomas. <laughs> Setting, a high school English classroom after school where the writers clubs used to meet before there was a shooting in the school. Maya was locked down in this room during the shooting. You're late. Well, we got here before Lydia. Did you hear from her? Is she coming? Why would she? Because she can take everything that happened to us and do something with it. We can write something that makes a difference in this world. Yeah, yeah. We, we already heard your soapbox speech over the phone. I don't know if this is up Lydia's alley. Why wouldn't it be? She's in the writer's club, isn't she? So, how are you guys? I'm fine. Never been better. Jimmy. What? D did you want the real answer? Yeah, I do. That's how we're going to write something meaningful. It's how we're actually going to make a change. Fine. Um, the surgery was hard. Recovery is harder. Because I, I can't go to the places I love. 
Like your mom's house. Jimmy, this is serious. How... Do you have any actual ideas? No. Tyler always had ideas. Well, Tyler's not gonna come now, is he? Are we writing an essay? Maybe a play or a poem. You think Republican senators can understand poetry? True. But we have to write something, so let's start with an idea. We never thought it would happen here, but then it did. Shock people out of ignorance. The thing is, I didn't think it could never happen here. I did the walkout in eighth grade and went to protest starting freshman year because I knew it could. But, like, you were surprised when it actually happened, right? Yeah, but we're walking down the hall and we hear it and... Then what happened? What did you see? He... He what? I just thought, shit, today's the day. Like, it was inevitable, which it practically is with the current laws. Lydia enters slowly, but the others haven't noticed yet. I just... And I just thought, thank God I don't have to take that math test. And I stand by that. But shocked that it can't happen here. I didn't get to policy because it did happen here and it can happen anywhere else in this country. Okay, but we still don't have a story. We could use me and Jimmy's experience and use Tyler. What about my brother? They turn and see her. You came. Does that mean you're less broken or uh, more uh, broken than we thought? Jimmy. You said you're using my brother. That came out wrong. She didn't mean use him. She meant use his story for the piece. Huh. She sits down and fidgets with the zipper on her jacket. The others look at her and then at each other. Do you have any ideas, Lydia? Lydia doesn't say anything. Okay. I don't think an essay is enough to get people to listen. People write essays on gun violence every day and look where we are. But ours is going to be different. What about a song? That would be different. The medium isn't what's going to set us apart. It's the fact that our story will be real. We have the power to write something real because we were the ones that actually went through it. Are you sure you're okay, Lydia? You never asked if I was okay. Are you? Lydia doesn't answer. She keeps playing with her zipper. Let's go back to the poem idea. Uh, let's see. Roses are red. I was almost dead. I may have been shot, but I'm still good in- Jimmy! What? Stop making a joke out of this. Well, what else do you want me to do? Be real. This is real. You want to join hands and sing Kumbaya and cry? Go for it, but count me out. Also, you've got a stupid cliche story. It's not funny. Did it sound like I was trying to be funny? Well, everyone? Copes in different ways, Maya. How about we just make sure this never happens again so nobody else has to cope with this kind of thing ever again? Exactly, maybe. Okay, wait, remember that musical we saw once about the kids in the school shooting? Yeah, it was horrible. Well, maybe it was horrible because it wasn't written by people who knew what they were talking about. We know what we're talking about. No, it was horrible because it focused on a shooter. Well, that was a unique take. It was trying to get a different perspective, but... No, it wasn't. Every article and news story and tweet and church has the thoughts and prayers and forgive the shooter bullshit. It's ridiculous. In real life, nobody forgives the shooter. I forgive him. What? Oh, she speaks. What do you mean you forgive the shooter? I mean, I forgive him. Be because of your uh, Christian guilt shit, right? No, because it's easier than actually making a change. You think it's easy? It means you get, just get to be okay with everything that happens. You don't have to do anything about it. Write that. You, go, you can go ahead and be okay with it, but I'm not going to. You think I'm okay with my brother being dead? It's, it's not what I said. It's what you meant. Lydia. I didn't forgive Jack because it's easy. I did it because it feels good. Huh? Like, I couldn't stop him, but I could be better than him. That won't stop it from happening again. Well, what will? 
talking about how kids were shot and killed, everybody talks about the school shootings every time. We did it before we were kids. Do you know how many people died in Parkland? I don't know, like... 17. Nothing changed when 17 people died in Parkland. So why would it, when only three kids die here? It doesn't really matter, does it? We have to keep trying. We put enough pressure on Congress and they have to make a change. Do you guys read the articles? The ones about us? You shouldn't. I read them. Did you see the one where they mentioned Tyler had just gotten back from a suspension? What? It wasn't big news outlet. You couldn't cite it in English class, but it was there. Maybe if they can see I'm good, if I'm so fucking good, I can forgive the man that killed my brother, I'll be worth listening to because they don't care about Tyler because he got suspended. If I'm just a good enough person, they'll want to save me, right? Right? Were the first graders at Sandy Hook not good enough people? That's not funny, Jimmy. It wasn't a joke. He's right. They aren't gonna listen. So I forgive Jack. Don't forgive his, don't give his, don't say his name. You sat next to him in freshman chemistry. You know his name. Don't give him the notoriety. Do you think not saying his name is gonna make any of us forget what he did? He doesn't deserve the recognition. And since when was this about what anyone deserves? Exactly. I don't forgive Jack because he deserves it. I forgive him because it's really, really hard. So it feels really good to do it. Being angry isn't gonna do anything but hurt me. Write that down. No. What do you mean? We finally have something. Maya, chill the fuck out. Stop being a dick, Jimmy. She's actually trying to do something. Yeah, and it's annoying. Why, because you haven't done anything? I did something. I became your fucking martyr. You're welcome. You're not dead, and you aren't doing shit to help the people that are. Writing isn't gonna bring them back. It might not, but I... Take two seconds to grieve. But nothing happened to me. I'm totally fine. You got shot, and you saw it all happen, and you, Tyler, so you're all survivors, and I just... I'm just someone that hid in that fucking corner, so I have to do something. I have to write no, something. No, you don't. But <sighs> it's not going to undo anything. No, Maya's right. If we tell our story to politicians or voters or foundations, they have to listen. They're going to listen. Do you actually think you can talk about what happened, Emily? Have you even let yourself remember it? But everything happens for a reason. Maybe our reason is so that we can get something Maya. done. Isn't that what the church says about it, Lydia? That's stupid. I'm not good enough of a person to be God's vessel of getting shit done. It didn't happen so we could do something about it. It happened because no one could do anything to stop it. Yeah, it doesn't matter anymore. What matters is what we do next. We don't owe the world that. They owed us safety. They owed Tyler safety. We can't. I can't just not do anything. Nothing's okay. <laughs> you can put the pencil down, Maya. Maya holds onto the pencil for dear life. End of play. Welcome to America, where every 15 minutes, well, you know by now, we've spent 90 minutes together. You do the math. We've tried statistics. We've tried stories. Dreams. And nightmares. When are we going to wake up? When will it be? Enough. Look at the person beside you. There is a 58% chance that they or someone they care about will be impacted by gun violence in their lifetime. More likely than not. Look at the person next to you. How many more 15 minutes before tragedy touches their life? How many more 15 minutes before tragedy such as yours? You know the statistics. You've heard the stories. But have you taken the time? Have you been brave enough? Have you been strong enough to, to feel? feel? Jason Warner, Jalen Paul, Lee Carlisle, Ryan Devin Enough! 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 Enough!
One minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Michael Cody. I'm the artistic producer of Hashtag Enough. And uh, I have the distinct privilege to introduce our playwrights of these uh, eight plays. So if you guys could come up on the stage real quick. Let's come this way. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll introduce everybody in the uh, order of the plays. Um, Willa Kaliri, uh, playwright of rehearsal. Ariana Brumfield, a playwright of allegiance. Tane Leonard Peck, a playwright of In My Sights. Taylor Lafayette, playwright of Salted Language, or Salted Lemonade. There was some salty language in there. <laughs> Anya Jimenez, playwright of It's Okay. <laughs> Mackenzie Boyd, playwright of Southside Summer. <laughs> Cameron Thiessen, playwright of Undo Redo. <laughs> and Win Elise Thomas, playwright of Right Their Wrongs. Uh, at this moment, we have a really special guest that I'd like to just bring on stage for a moment. Um, if uh, Manuel Oliver could come to the stage, please. That's my entrance. Wow, this was great, man. Um, I wish I could remember all the names that I need to thank today, all the kids. Um, Joaquin, if you can stand up. Joaquin. He was, he was here a minute ago. <laughs> oh, no, no. Joaquin was shot in Portland. And he's my son. And now I have your attention. And Joaquin's mom, Patricia, is right there. Can you please stand up? And just like you, she heard these stories tonight. For us, this is our story. What you guys did is not acting, it's reacting. Okay? You keep that in mind. And I wish you guys will be writing other stuff. But we are getting used to this. It happens, it's in the news. And then anyone that is really excited about writing plays decides to write about ending gun violence. What you heard today are not readings. These are testimonials. What are you clapping at? What is it that we are celebrating here? Is it the talent? Is it the story? What is it? Think about that. Think about how you can prevent being me. 
the guy that calls out its son's name to stand up. And Joaquin will never stand up. So I think we're all Joaquin, potentially. Right? We don't know if I'm going to be able to be here tomorrow. Um, you don't know if you're going to be able to be here tomorrow. Sad but true. But while I was listening to these readings, I was like reading the news. A week ago, Patricia and myself, we were in the Oval Office with President Biden. We were inside the Oval Office. Isn't that cool? I have a picture of it. Talking about gun violence. Less than 24 hours later, it was a guy shooting randomly in the New York subway. We are getting used to that. We are getting used to this. And I'm glad that I'm here tonight. And I'm glad that I met you. But I hate the reason why I'm here tonight. Someone just said everything happens for a reason. The reason why Joaquin was shot was inaction from our politicians. Yes, everything happens for a reason, but what is the reason? Look for the reason and fight against the reason. When I came up here on stage with my magnificent entrance, I asked Joaquin to stand up. I'm telling you, we are all Joaquin. Joaquin, please stand up. Patricia, don't you love this? Thank you very much to all of you, to you, my friend, because you're doing a great job, and to all you guys, because you're awesome. We can win this fight. Find the reason and make sure that you don't take this as a normal thing, because it's not. Thank you for having us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you.